I hope most of you don't find this too boring. And uh, I know that most of you guys are saying, what do I care about a Franklin engine? They haven't built them since 1950. And, uh, but believe it or not, there's still a lot of them flying around. And I feel privileged that I know enough about them that I can kind of work on them. <clears throat> if my voice fails, I'll let one of you guys come up here because I know there's a lot of knowledge sitting here today who probably know more about the subject than I do. So, like I said, I'll try not to bore you to death. And you turbine guys just struggle through the best you can. My name is Jack Stewart, and like most everybody here, I'm an AMBIA, and I teach part-time in Lincoln Land College. And uh, that's where this idea came from. I'm working on a guy's Franklin right now, and I have the cylinders in school working on them while I'm also teaching a class. And uh, the instructor came to me, uh, our director came out and he said, hey, you need to do a presentation on Franklin engines. And I said, nobody wants to hear anything about a Franklin engine. And then I realized that a lot of you guys are the same age as I am, so maybe it's a good idea after all. So a little bit of history. The Franklin Company was formed in 1902. They actually started building cars. And this is an air-cooled Franklin chassis. And if you look at the chassis rails, <laughs> looks like a couple of spruce tubefores. And the fan down at the bottom picks up the air, of course, and blows it across the cylinders. We're in an airplane, we don't have to worry about that. And they were a really successful car company. They made some great cars. This is a uh, this is a mid twenties, and you'll notice there's no radiator. Of course, there's no radiator. It's an air cooled engine because it's a Franklin. And uh, I, when I was a young guy, I also worked for a guy that was into antique cars, and he had one about like this. And it always fascinated me that hey, in the twenties they had air cooled engines. Well, shoot, that's a thing that would come along in the 60s. Well, in 1947, a guy named Tucker, who was quite the salesman, I understand, he started a car company, and this is the car that he built. And he bought air-cooled motors because the 30s outdone them in. So a group of employees got together, and they bought Franklin Engine Company and renamed it Air-Cooled Motors. Well, Mr. Tucker, when he came along, he said, I want an air-cooled engine in my car. So you can look at this car, and it was called a Tucker Torpedo, and it was years ahead of its time. It's, it has a big airplane influence, and if I can get this thing to work here, now, but anyway, you'll notice right back here, that's an air intake air intake for the engine that is real similar to the same engine that we run on our airplanes. 335 cubic inch. Only he changed the top cylinders a little bit. Instead of having individual cylinders like we have on an airplane, he had three cylinders cast in one. But they worked real good. You go 51 of them, and the story goes that the big three car companies got together and ran him out of business because he had a better product than they had. Well, we'll let history determine that. But you can see the airplane influence here in the interior of the car. It's got a padded dash, which was unheard of in 1947. All the instruments were over there by the driver, so they, they wouldn't interfere with the passenger if they ran into something. Of course, seat belts in cars was totally unheard of. So, Mr. Tucker, after he went out of business, 1947, the company went into limbo, and air cool motors kind of just floated along for a while. And uh, but they they still in World War II, the air cooled engine was air cool motors engine. 
was a big engine in World War II. They powered a lot of the L planes. There was the L5, which was extensive. And they built engines all the way from 110 cubic inches up to a 12 cylinder, 880 cubic inch engine. But the most common engine that we have today, that we still see around, you'll see in the sense Stinson airplane. And that happens to be my airplane on the left. And another one that I take care of. Right. The one on the left, the red one, which is Stinson Maroon, is a 1947 model Dash 2. And the red and white one is a 48 model, which is a Dash 3. And it's the last full year that they actually built airplanes. After the 1947 run, the factory set kind of in limbo for a while, and Piper Aircraft bought them out. They bought them out because the Piper wanted a twin engine airplane that they didn't have, the huge craft and Cessna did. So they bought Stinson to get the or they bought Piper to, to Stinson to get the Piper Apache. The Piper Apache was actually a Stinson designed airplane. And if you look at Piper Tri-Pacers, even up through the Piper Cherokee series, look at the cow latches on them. The cow latch is actually a Stinson cow latch. Uh, Univera gets 100 and Piper gets about 150, 60 bucks for those latches. You can order a Stenson latch from Univer for $60. <clears throat> Don't tell the FAA I said that. <laughs> anyway, the history is really interesting because uh, these are historical aircraft. Also, uh, you might see a Belanca once in a while, a Swift. A Bell 47 helicopter, had a gentleman talk about Bell a while ago. All those, all those had stints in the air, Franklin engines in them. Um, another airplane that comes to mind is a Mall. And believe it or not, some early 172 systems had Franklin engines in them. They've probably all been replaced now by Wycoming or Continental. <clears throat> some interesting things too. If you look at a Continental engine, I can see a lot of things that they copied right off of Franklin. People say, oh, no, they didn't copy nothing. Well, shoot, everybody copied off everybody else, didn't they? After all, if you look at the cylinders, here again, Franklin was way ahead of everybody else. This is a typical 0320 like coming cylinder on the left, and 0200 or 0300 continental cylinder on the right, and the Franklin cylinders in the middle. Well, the Franklin cylinder was cast all in one piece of aluminum. Where, as you know, like only the Continental cylinders, only the head's aluminum and the barrel is made out of steel. Well, Franklin cast theirs in one piece and then put a steel line around them. And today, this would probably be cost prohibitive. The companies would never stand for that. But if you, if you look at if you put a, a Franklin engine side by side with a Lycoming, you'll see that the Franklin engine is a whole lot more precision engine than what a Lycoming is. I think some people might disagree with that. And here's the cylinders again, and you'll look at the top of the head. It was all machined out. It wasn't a rough casting, not like the other guys do. Nice machine, smooth work. And this picture don't show it too well, but you can see there the steel sleeve. So what that does is you can take a Franklin cylinder and unless it's cracked or something, you can just keep overhauling it about as many times as you want. You heat it up, I think the book says 600 degrees in an oven, and you can pull the steel sleeve right out of it, slide the steel sleeve in, bored out to the correct dimensions, and you've got a new cylinder. At the same time, when you got it heated up, you knock the valve guides out, pull the valve seats out, put new seats and guides in, you've got a new cylinder. Well, it's overhauled, right? We've got to call it overhauled. So, the big difference is this. Come on, Dave, here we go. You look at a Franklin engine, if you guys ever look at one of these things, and you see 
a set screw at the bottom of the cylinder. Don't try to tighten it up. That's what holds the sleeve in. They put a little plug in there and the set screw goes in and holds that sleeve in where it belongs. They actually drill a hole through the sleeve and you can see on the inside that little plug. They do that before they machine it out. And here again, you don't oversize a Franklin cylinder where on my coins and condemns, they'll bore them out 10 thousandths or 15 thousandths, whatever they want to. You don't do that. You replace the sleeve and the book only gives you 1 thousandths tolerance. That's it. You don't get 10 or 15. So they got a steel sleeve, they got a little plug that holds the sleeve in. They also take a different spark plug. This is the only readily available approved spark plug for a Franklin engine right now, or EJ38. Uh, Joe was talking about Champion. We have tried and tried to get Champion to fire up and make us some of these spark plugs because they only fire up their line about every 10 years and they tell us that they have to completely tear down the line, rebuild it in order to make this plug. Why? Look at the end of it. It looks like an automotive plug. It's not massive electro. So they have to completely retool their line to make them. Well, when they first make a batch, 100,000 or so, you can buy them for about 30 bucks a piece. I just bought a set and put the guys playing here a while back and I give $70 a piece for them. He wasn't happy, but I told him, you know, you're not going to be happy if that plane's just sitting in your hangar. You want to fly it or not? I'm sorry. It's the only plugs I can find. Uh, some of the companies advertise, yeah, we've got these plugs and we'll sell them to you for 30, 40, 50 bucks, whatever it is. But if they've got them, they'll sell them to you for that. But if they don't have them, they can't very well sell them to you. Here you can see the plug compared to an REM40. Standard plug in our light and continentals. Also, the RM40, you guys that used to work on my comics, what do they torque to? Come on! 360 inch pounds. Around 30 foot pounds, yeah, 360 inch pounds. Don't ever torque one of those 14 millimeter plugs in a Franklin engine over 20 or 22 pounds because you'll crack the head, and I don't know how many of those cylinders I've replaced because the head's been cracked. And I can always tell when I pull the plugs out of one if a light or continental guy's been working on them because you can't only get those 14 millimeter plugs loose. And like I said, uh, that red and white plane, he rolled it out one day after an annual that I didn't do, and he was trying to start it and it, it would hit, but it wouldn't quite start. And he waved at me, and I walked over, and we pulled the prop through, and you could hear air coming out. She was cracked by one of the spark plugs, and we got the plug out, which took a wrench about that long. And sure enough, there was a crack in the spark plug hole. So if you happen to be on the ramp someday, and a Stinson lands at your airport, and it's running a little rough, and you say, well, okay, let's pull the plugs out and have a look at them. When you put them back in, about 18 foot pounds is all you want. 20 tops. Also, it says, if you read that over here, it says gap of 20 thousandths normal. 18 to 20 thousandths is the gap on one. And here again, it's an automobile plug. So stick your feeler gauge, or your wire gauge, between that electrode sticking out, get about 18 or 20 thousandths, and you're good to go. <clears throat> now another big thing on Franklin engines, this is a Continental, all you guys recognize it, intake manifold. It's in three pieces. So it's got some give when you bolt it on the cylinders. No problem, put it on there. Torque it up, good to go. But 
the Franklin engine, the intake manifold's made in one piece. Here it is along the bottom, that yellow bar. This is a this is a brand new fuel injected Franklin 220 that's made in Poland. I've never seen one, and well, I've seen one in person at Dodge Dodge. But anyway, if you look at that intake manifold, it's in one piece. If you do ever have to pull a cylinder off a Franklin engine, number one, you should have the book there. Don't try to work on one of these things without a manual. Or call somebody that knows about the manual. Because you put the cylinders on and you leave the cylinder base nuts finger tight. And then you bolt the intake log on without gaskets and you torque it up. And then you torque the cylinder base nuts. If you do it any other way, I guarantee you, you'll have an intake leak. Your engine won't run right, and you'll say, oh, that Jack don't know what he's talking about. Well, I'm like the, what's that, farmer's insurance group. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. And I've worked on these for a while now, and I love them. <clears throat> That's something personal. <clears throat> and I told you about a guy's engine. I was doing an annual on his airplane. He's got a beautiful Stenson. It's a 1946 straight 108, no dash numbers. So it's got a 150 Franklin in it. The only difference between a 150 and a 165 is they got a little different camshaft and a bigger carburetor. And they turn the 165 another 100 RPM to get that extra 50 horsepower out of it, or 15 horsepower out of it. Outside of that, it's basically the same engine. They're both 335 cubic inch. Uh, a lot of the parts will interchange. So anyway, I'm doing an annual on this guy's plane, and one of the cylinders is low compression. Well, another nice thing about a Franklin is they have hydraulic valve lifters, but they have adjustable rocker arms. Unlike a Lycoming where it says, what? 20 to 80 thousandths or whatever it gives you a, gives you a wide margin. Franklin's gone. They say adjust the valves at 40 thousandths with a collapsed lifter. Don't you dare ask me what a collapsed lifter means. <laughs> <coughs> so you collapse the lifter and you set the valves at 40 thousandths. Not 39, not 41, 40 thousandths. Or that engine won't run right. And don't ask me how I know that. So, anyway, I thought maybe, maybe a valve would tighten up or something. That's why we had low compression on that one cylinder. So I popped the valve covers off, and the second I get the valve cover off, I find all this nice little stuff inside the valve cover. Wow. You can also see there's some rust inside the valve cover. That's common anymore on general aviation airplanes, right guys? They sit in the hangar more than they fly. So moisture builds up in the engine, you get rust inside stuff. Sad to say, but that's that's facts of life. Five dollar, six dollar gallon gasoline and stuff like that, and insurance premiums, and people just don't fly like they used to. We know that. So anyway. I got metal inside the valve cover. Well, I do have some people that know more than I do, so I can call them. And I call a couple of guys and say, what do you think? It's not really metal flakes. It's more like metallic paint. It's real fine. So what do you think? And the first guy I call, he says, oh, probably the cannon lifters. Yeah. Afraid he's going to say that because that's what I was thinking. <clears throat> so we go ahead and tear the engine down. And while I'm tearing the engine down, I pull one of the cylinders off and I say, Whoa, what's that? What have we got here? <laughs> what is that crap? Well, <coughs> the exhaust flanges are down. So somebody had a muffler off. They decided that the exhaust gaskets wouldn't stay on, so they're going to put some silicone sealer and glue them up there while they put the muffler on. 
Well, what happened? Well, they put a gob of silicone sealer on one side, and that cocks the gasket. We got a leak. Exhaust leak. Well, what usually happens on an air-cooled motor when you get an exhaust leak? You're out flying on a nice cool day, and you come in and shut her off, and that piston happens to be down, and that valve open, and she sucks cool air back up in there, and bang, you've got a warped exhaust valve. Anybody that ever rode a Harley Davidson knows about that. You lose an exhaust gasket, and you're going to lose an exhaust valve. And that's exactly what happened. This is a cylinder at low compression. You have a warped exhaust valve. Okay, we get all the cylinders off, and I'm refurbishing on myself, except that one. I send it to a guy that specializes in these Franklin cylinders, and it's still down there right now. He's putting a new exhaust guide valve. He's overhauling that cylinder for me. Um, a few years ago, and of course you know yourself, there's experts in everything, right? Everybody's an expert on the internet. If you don't believe it, just post a question. You'll get 50 answers in 10 minutes. I had this guy call me up. And you know yourself, not too many people work on these things. In fact, some people will run away from them. I had this guy call me up and he said, uh, my plane's not running real well. It don't climb out very well. It's kind of low on power. What do you think? And I said, well, bring it over. I work in Jacksonville. Todd Cole and I are kind of partners in a hangar. We work on people's airplanes. That's what we do, right guys, for a living. I said, bring it over and I'll have a look at it. Well, about an hour went by and he called me up and he said, uh, it's running worse today than normal. Could you come over and see what's wrong with it? Well, working on the kind of planes that I do, I make house calls. So I throw a bag of tools on my plane and fly over to his airport. And he's right, I couldn't put my finger on it, but it wasn't running just quite right. It wasn't missing, it wasn't, I don't know, this, you know, something in your gut tells you it's just not right. Well, how long's it been since the mags were off? Joe always talks about mags, right? Well, we got to look at this about 400 hours, and slick mags. I said, okay, let's send them in. So we pulled the mags off and I sent them up to Dennis. Fix these mags. And a week or so went by. Boy, they jumped right on. We got the mags back. I stick the mags back, get them all in time. Make sure I pull the pin out before we pull the prop. <laughs> get them all timed up and fired up. And it runs better, but it's still not quite right. Well, I look at a few more things and then it dawned on me. Well, maybe we better check the valve clearance. Because this engine just had a top overhaul 68 hours before I work on it. So we start pulling valve covers off, and I got a fever gauge, but you could have used the matchbook because the valves were anywhere from about 60 thousandths to 180 thousandths. I said, wow. I think we found the problem. And while I'm looking, I take my thumb and put it on a valve spring and push the valve open with my thumb. Whoa, wait a minute. The book says it's supposed to take at least 50 pounds to unseat the valve. As far as I know, Franklin's the only one that's got that in her book. I've never seen it before. I don't remember her continental book pressure to unseat the valve, and I'm doing it with my thumb, and I'm not leaning real hard. So I tell him, well, I think we better replace the valve springs while we're here. Well, he said, it's only got 68 hours since it had a top overhaul. 
they surely put new springs in. And I said, well, I don't know. I'm going to call me surely. So we ordered new valve springs. And we get them a week or so later, and I'm back over there. And I hook some air up with the cylinders. You guys know how to change valve springs without taking the cylinders off. It's real easy. And we start pulling valve springs off, and I get to looking at them. And no two are alike. In fact, a couple of them look like they belong on an old Ford tractor. I'm, I'm looking at these things, and some of them I'm squeezing together with my fingers like that. Jesus, how does this thing even run? And I said, who done the top overhaul? Well, they said, we got the cylinders from, never mind, not a company around here that any of you are familiar with. Somebody that thinks they're Franklin experts. We'll leave it at that. So we replaced all the valve springs. I set the valves to 40,000, so like they're supposed to be. We roll it out, and I tell him when we're rolling out of the hangar, I said, buddy, if this don't fix it, I'm out of ideas. I don't know. And we fire it up, and he taxis down, and he takes off, and he flies once around the batter, and he comes back and sets her down, and he taxis in, and he's got a smile on his face this big. He gets out of his plane, and he says, it's never ran this good. I've owned it for four years, and it's never ran this well. I said, oh, boy. Good job, Jack. And it's still flying. <coughs> Just fine today. In fact, Four years ago, we had a mass fly-in, Stinson mass fly-in from Oshkosh. We, we left Watertown, Wisconsin, and flew into Oshkosh, 26 of us. And we're having a pilot briefing. And the lead pilot says, we're gonna fly at 100 miles an hour, 90 knots. And a couple of the guys speak up, well, I've only got 150. It, I don't think it'll keep up with you guys. And this guy, flying a 150, says, well, by God, you better let Jack fix it then, because mine will. <laughs> Made me feel pretty good, though. Oh, valve adjustment's very important. Valve spring pressure's very important. Reading the manual is very important. Uh, they're available. There's several places you can get the manuals for these old things. They're not hard to come by. They're cheap. Not much reading to be had. I think there's only about 40 pages. It's not like one of the big boys. So if you ever happen to run across one of these things, and it could happen, if you don't know what you're doing, call somebody. Call in. You don't have to call me. I don't know what I'm doing. Shoot, you guys are smarter than I am. I just happen to have a gift of gab. But like I said, I love working on these things. And uh, there are several companies that do provide parts for them. There's a few parts that's very limited. Uh, pistons. For a while, we was taking helicopter pistons and cutting the top off them because uh, the compression ratio is a lot different on one of these than it is a helicopter. They get 220 horsepower out of a helicopter, and we get 165 out of one of these. One more note. Where's the FAA people? <laughs> In the other room, I hope. MOGAS. I run MoGas in mine all the time. Most of the guys I know run MoGas. Why? Because these engines were originally designed to run on the old 8087. How long has it been since you've seen 8087? 40 years? More? I don't know. But the old 8087 was actually an unleaded gas. So if you can find unleaded car gas, with no ethanol in it, don't be putting alcohol in your airplane drinking. No, it's no gas. Put no gas in your in your planes. Even the, the old Continental 200s, 
All those engines only have about seven and a half to one compression ratio, or seven. They don't need 100 volt lead. Right after I got my plane, several years ago, because of the way those spark plugs are made, lead will build up around that electrode real quick. And about 10 or 12 hours, you're going to be pulling plugs out and cleaning them, I guarantee it, if you don't do something about the lead. So, run more gas. Here's another thing. <clears throat> I say you don't need an SDC to do it. Shh, Kurt, where you at? Stay up. There is an SDC available to run low gas for your airplanes. I say you don't need it. Why? What do you do? You give a guy 500 bucks, what do you get for 500 bucks for that SDC? You get a piece of paper, and you get this little stainless steel tag to go on your intake manifold. You're not modifying the airplane. An SDC allows you to change from the type certificate, right? <clears throat> Well, what's my type certificate say on it? It says you'll run 80, 87 gas. I'm running 92 octane, unleaded, non ethanol gas. And I got in a, not an argument, but a discussion one day with an FAA guy about, well, the octane rating's different. Octane, schmoctane. My airplane runs this fine on this stuff. So why do I need to pay a guy 500 bucks for a piece of paper and a little stainless steel tag with a number on it? I'm not modifying the airplane. By that logic, on my type certificate data sheet, it says 8087 gas. By that logic, I'd have to have an SDC to run 100 low lead in it. Well, he didn't have an answer for that. And this program was brought to you by Jack, and these opinions are strictly mine. That's my disclaimer. Anyway, what do we got? Oh, we got time to talk about Franklin Case. You'll probably never get this deep into one. <coughs> and you can see that the case is a little different because a Franklin has an oil pan, just like Continental copy. But they've also got a removable top cover. I can take the top cover off of one and look right down in there, and I don't even need a bore so I can look at the condition of the, the cam shaft. If you want to, it's it's a work, but you can actually take the, the connecting rods out of one without splitting the case. I don't know why you would, but anyway. You know, 50, how uh, you can tell? Because up in the front of the case, it's got these little grooves. It was later on, the later 150s and the 165s, when they started using the sealer and strain method that we put all the rest of the engines together with today. But they actually have a rubber that goes in that little groove and seals the case up. There's also one that goes back here. Of course, the accessory case happens and goes on the back of the pan. So the only places you need to seal the case is the front and that little rear corner. You got the top, you got a cover on the top, and a wall pan on the bottom, so you don't need the rest of that stuff. And this happens to be the engine I've got in Jacksonville now. I'm getting ready to put it back together. I've got the crankshaft back together, and the rods are on it. And hopefully, in a week or two, I'll have it back in here. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, you turpin guys, you can wake up now. Uh, yes, sir? Light case, heavy case. What's the definition? You don't see a light case. The early Franklin engines had light cases, and most of them cracked and were replaced. Once in a while, I'll see a light case. If it's made it for 70 years, I figure it's going to make it for a while longer. But the difference was being that the, the white case was built a little uh, lighter around the main bearings and they tended to crack. So the heavy cases 
they put a little more meat in there and, and address that problem. I do know of one flying. It's got a 150 light case in it. Like I said, if it's made it this long, what the heck, I've made it this long, so. And I, I shot one of the FAA guys this morning when I told him I'll be 70 my next birthday, so um, my plane's a year older than me. It turned 70 last night. I'm sorry. Yes, Joe. I have a question for you. Let me, get, let me get closer because I don't hear very good. I got you. I, I had a question about whether or not you addressed the fact that PCL owns the Franklin engine TC and they're currently in production in Poland. They don't build a lot, but they're building two to three hundred um, two to three hundred of the engines a year. I, I spoke to the family that owns it. Oh, I've talked to Roman myself. Okay. Well, through an interpreter. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's talking about in 1977, the Franklin family still owned the type certificate, and they sold it to some Polish people. Why they wanted it, I don't know, but anyway, they did. And they took the type certificate for the engine that we use to Poland, and even the Polish government jumped in on it and gave them some money, and it's PCL. Dash CO. I don't speak Polish, so I don't know what that means. But that real pretty engine I showed you a while ago, if it's not too much trouble to back through. Come on, baby. That is a PCL, a Polish 220 horsepower Franklin engine. It's fuel injected, it has some improvements. But basically, it's the same engine that we've got. That crankshaft will fit right in 165 like mine. The big deal is my crankshaft is an 8-volt crankshaft, like the old Cessna 300, 300s had the 8-volt crank on them. Well, if you look, this one's smaller. It's a 6-volt crank. So if I would want to put a new crankshaft in my engine, which they will sell you one, $3,500, so I've been told. Uh, you're going to have to change the prop, you're going to have to change the backing plate, so you're going to end up, you're still going to have ten grand in an engine, and that's just for the crankshaft and the prop. But anyway, they claim, and Joe, Joe was quoted, and he's talking to the people, I've talked to them to the ice guys, they, they have a booth up there, uh, they claim that they're making so many of these a month or so many a year. They have that same engine of ice gosh every year. I know of three airplanes in the United States that's got their engine in it. I don't think they've had any problems with it. But cost-wise, you can there is an STC to convert Stensons to Lycoming engines, if that's what you want to do. I prefer just to keep overhauling my old Franklins and keep on chugging away. If you guys ever get a chance to fly in a Stinson, take it. It's the smoothest running engine you'll ever fly behind outside of a turkey. I, I don't know what the difference is, but they're a whole lot smoother than a six cylinder Continental for some reason. Here again, these opinions are mine and mine alone. And if the FAA asks, I was never here. This conversation never took place. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Yes. Hey, here's a good one for you. The uh, we're doing an annual inspection on one thing to what we're supposed to go through in 43 Appendix D. Is there as we look through this engine? Is there anything unusual in all those things uh, when we're inspecting it to look for? Outside of like I said, the valve adjustment. I don't I don't adjust the valves every annual because most planes that I work on fly 40 hours a year, maybe every other annual. Or if he, uh, I've got one guy that does fly about 120, 130 hours a year, and I'll, I'll pull the valve covers off and I'll check the valve clearance. Does it have a standard oil screen? And what? 
we're supposed to check oil screen or filter? Does it have a standard? Uh, Sorry to say, Franklin engines do not have an oil screen. If uh, a lot of them that I work on have a new remote oil filter on, I've got one on mine. Uh, the guy whose engine was had metal in it, he just ordered one. We're going to put it on this weekend. It would have. Luckily, this engine didn't crash itself. The bearings, the crankshaft, could have been a whole lot worse. We caught it just at the right time. Uh, I got one load on the cam and one lifter that we got to we got to throw away. There's camshafts still available for them. Thank goodness. Uh, there's companies that reface lifters. Um, so you can you can take an old used lifter and reface it and put it in the engine and go. So to answer your question as best I can, about the only difference in an annual on a Franklin engine and any other engine is the valve adjustment. And like I say, there's no oil screen if it's got a remote filter or take it off, cut it open, see what's in there, like we always do on anything. And uh, go from there. Hopefully, you won't find anything. But if you start finding metal and then the engine's got to come apart, they're not hard to take apart. Uh, there is a few little things different. They've got some bolts on the inside of the case that the other guys don't have. Uh, you've got to have two or three special tools. Uh, cylinder base nut wrenches for a light going or continental won't work on them because the cylinders are fatter. Uh, it takes a special tool to get inside. There's eight uh, castellated nuts inside by the uh, main bearings that have to be taken out. And it takes a special little tool to do that. Well, here again, the internet's a wonderful thing. And Stinson, Franklin, has a wonderful following on the internet. And you can get all this information. I made these tools myself. They're not hard. Shoot if you can weld and run a torch. Bend some metal up, you can make these cylinder base nut wrenches and other stuff. So, no big deal. Is it easy to check ignition time? Oh, yeah. The ignition timing checks just like anything else. Uh, it's got marks on the crankshaft similar to the like on me, so you don't have to stand on your head like Continental. Usually, what I do, airplane, uh, it's, it's got a, a spinner on it, right? And I learned this a long time ago. You have to take the nose bolt off the prop and all that stuff and get the engine exactly on top dead center, right? So your your straight edge is lined up with your mark on your flywheel up. Same as Lycoming or anybody else. <laughs> well, after I get it right on top dead center or I get it on my timing mark, the 150 is timing 28 degrees, the 165 is timing 32 degrees. I get it on the timing mark and I put it all back together and I take a straight edge, and there's a bar in the center of the windshield with screws in it, and I line that up, and I just make me a mark on the backing plate. So I can take the spinner off, roll it around, line that mark up, and I'm on time. I don't take the nose bolt off and a prop off every time I start like that to check the timing. And uh, most of them I work on have slick mags, so easy to time those. I happen to prefer Bendix, which is what's on mine. <laughs> For the simple reason, it's easier to get to the points if I have to change points in them. That's all. And uh, there's, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, I don't think there's a 500 hour inspection on Bendix mags, are there? The old Bendix. Four year overhaul requirement for anything made prior to 2018. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have I don't have no overall slicks. No, not no well. You know, that's kind of more. Right. Yeah, that's all I have to send my mags up to you, buddy. <laughs> anyway. Anything else? Yeah, right here. Yeah. You need to swim on your head more. You're you're looking that way most of the time. Okay, I'm sorry. I used to have a 108 and the prop was set at uh 10 and 
o'clock, four o'clock. So you used to do a lot of stamp problems and get batteries and stuff. Do I still have what problems? I still I still put the no, problem. No, I'm not for the five stamp. Oh I changed them. I set the engine at uh, twenty-eight degrees and moved the props to one o'clock, seven o'clock position and it runs smooth. Hmm. I just thought you might want to know that. Yeah, that is, yeah, because I Looks usually put it. there probably didn't know it either. <laughs> I, I usually put the prop on it at one and four. I mean, that's, that's what we've always been taught. And uh, another thing about Stenson, or Franklin's, if you have to hand prop one, which I have had to hand prop one occasionally, they got impulse couplings on both mags. If you have to move the prop over about that far to get it started, Probably something else wrong someplace, but I can I can give her about three shots of the throttle. God, it has to be really cold to use a primer on one because they got a big old made four carburetor on them, and you move the throttle and it shoots in a big charge of gas with the accelerator on them. Give her about three shots, pull the prop through about twice. I even had my wife sitting in one, sitting in mine up at Galesburg. I guess when I was getting out. I kicked the master switch or something, I don't know. But we come back to the plane and I hit the switch and all right. So my wife who is not a pilot again, shh, FA guys. <coughs> I just had her move her feet over because I don't have right hand brakes on mine. I just had her move her feet over and hold the brakes. And I said, had the had the throttle push it about that far. And I said, when the lights pull that throttle back just as quick as you can. I hate hearing them guys go out there and fire them planes up and they're turning 2,000 RPM cold engine. So I said, as soon as she likes, pull that. And I did. Move the prop about that far and it's running. Okay, thanks. And then uh, we get the plane to come on. And they're, they're real easy to hand start. But uh, what'd you say? You put it at 7 and 2 or no? 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock. 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock. Wait a minute. One o'clock and seven. I don't know about you all, but I like five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're looking at. Yeah. yeah. Just pull it your way. Yeah. Kind of and you right. had a one away? I did the same thing on my phone as well. I never asked. Did it have a Franklin on your swivel? No. no. Got a 282 Continental. Yeah. Some of the, some of the old swivels had Franklin's in them. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, good. Gotta keep us going. Like I said, parts availability is not bad. Uh, the bearings, all the stuff, well, the gaskets are fresh, but all the old bearings that we're putting in this Franklin uh, that I'm working on in Jacksonville is all new old stock. How long's it been since you had to clean Cosmo and all of a sudden, guys? God, it's nasty stuff, and you just can't hardly get it off. Wash it off over in the parts washer and use some MEK on it. It's still not clean enough to see. Anyway, you've been a great bunch of guys. Thanks very much, and I'll see you after lunch. Huh? <laughs>